Welcome to another episode of the Mental Toughness Podcast. This is Matt Phillips, of course, the founder of Pro Athlete Advantage. And probably the thing I love most about this podcast is that I get to introduce you to highly innovative, influential, and just special individuals to talk about mindset and leadership, mental toughness, and to give you these these nuggets of wisdom that you can integrate into your daily life. Now, this podcast is no exception because I get to introduce you to a man named Peter Lynch. Peter is the founder of Hitch Studio. You can visit www.hitch, it's H-I-T-C-H dot studio. It is a company focused on training, culture, and the modern talent life cycle to create the future of talent. It is innovative. I am telling you, not only has he founded Hitch Studio, but he also has this phenomenal product called Meeting Spark. He is also the author of a book called The Ugly Advantage that we dive into at length in this podcast. And it's something that you are going to absolutely resonate with, how those kind of the, the ugly times in our life, those are the ones that are special. Those are the ones where we learn the most, where we develop the most. And Peter's going to give you his unique perspective on how you should embrace the ugly and use it as an advantage. Now, Peter, just to give you a little background, I've been very fortunate to get to know him over the past couple of years um, and, and really go deep on our relationship as we've both built our businesses. But I initially met Peter uh, back when we both worked for a Fortune 500 company called Western Union. Uh, that was the first time that I saw the first hand impact that he had on different individuals in the sales organization and others within Western Union. Uh, he is one of the most unique speakers and coaches and just thought leaders that I've ever come across in my life. And he makes me better each and every time that I get to sit with him. Uh, Peter, you know, has a huge background in uh, corporate America. He was a global executive with multiple Fortune 500 companies. Uh, but what is most unique, I think, about Peter is just how well-rounded he is and how he takes chances in his lives. So while he was working for these Fortune 500 companies, uh, he also became a TED speaker, a Top 50 podcaster, an award-winning entrepreneur, and a patent-holding inventor. I mean, his app's been downloaded in more than 70 countries. Uh, he was a winner of Denver's Hottest Startup, and his podcast was ranked higher than the Wall Street Journal and Harvard Business Review. So he has just taken advantage of the life that he has had, and he has fought through the ups and downs, has a phenomenal story about adversity early in his life, and he has used that to his absolute advantage. He's used that ugly to his advantage in what he does on a daily basis. Uh, get out your pen and paper. You're going to learn so much from the interview that I do with Peter Lynch. And again, an individual that inspires me to be better, he will inspire you as well. Peter Lynch, Hitch Studio, Meeting Spark. Check him out. I'm going to have all links to all of his social media down below in the show notes and have fun with this one. As he says, and I mentioned this in the podcast, his greatest skill is his epic dad joke telling ability where he can make his kids' eyes roll with 99% predictability. I love this guy, and you will too. Let me introduce the one and only Peter Lynch. Hey, Peter. Thank you so much for taking your time today. It's great to have you on the podcast. Hey, Matt. Thanks for having me. Uh, super excited. Love chatting with you. Always leave with some inspiration and challenges. Yeah, for those of you listening, Peter and I have the, uh, the opportunity to meet fairly frequently uh, and talk life and business and everything else in between. And uh, you should join us for one of our conversations if you're here in the Denver area, because uh, we, uh, we talk about some pretty fun stuff and, and we are both out to impact and change lives. So uh, yeah, come join us for a coffee at Starbucks one of these days. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, and you know, one, there's so many things that I want to dive in into you with today. 
But really, I want to start with what you and I have talked about before. But, you know, obviously, my business is focused on mental toughness, right? And growing this mindset. Yeah. And I want to just to ask you, when you hear mental toughness, when you hear those two words, like what comes to mind? Yeah, I mean, it's such a great word. You know, it's having, you know, had the chance to to be around professional sports with my my best friend and his brother and having a chance, you know, to be on sports teams and in big corporate organizations. I, I've really seen it as a differentiator. Mm-hmm. But I, I think a little I take a little bit of a different view, I think, and it, it kind of leads to the book, which hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about a little bit later, The Ugly Advantage. Yes. But to me, mental toughness is really a lot of it is really about finding the beauty in the ugliness of your story. You know, a, a lot of times we try to hide the ugly part. Um, and to me, mental toughness is to stop hiding that and recognizing that that in some instances is actually your greatest asset and your greatest strength. And it's not easy to embrace those ugly and hard things, but if you can find a way to do that, Whew, man, that that's where you're living in what you were designed to do. So to me, that's what I think of when I think of mental toughness. I love I love the way you talk about it because it's you know at the end of the day, it's you know we're all on this journey and we've got the ups and downs that go along with it, and we've got strength and we have weaknesses and yeah, and it's it's almost adopting this continuous improvement mindset where it's you know even no matter what you go through. Like yeah. embrace it and and own it and yep. know that it's an opportunity to learn. Yep. Um, I love that. Embrace the embrace the ugly. What, <laughs> what's you know from your personal life? What's one thing that you consider kind of ugly, if you will, something you're working on? Oh man, where to start? Uh, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> it begins with what I see when I look in the mirror, uh, and then. Now, there's there's lots of, you know, ugly things in my life. But, um, you know, one thing that could be considered ugly for me was, you know, the fact that I grew up with very little means. You know, I had a a single mom who busted her butt um, and we lived in a single wide mobile home, you know, and I wasn't really surrounded by a ton of examples of greatness, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. Um, I never knew my dad. And, you know, being a dad now today, you know, I remember that was something that was really hard for me. I I thought a a lot growing up, you know, I wish I had my dad. I wish I knew my dad. Mm. Um, And, you know, at the end of the day, it's funny. You know, I I, I think we have elements that are our weakness. And and one of my weaknesses tends to be um, over my life is when things get difficult, um, I will stop or I'll move on to something else. Hmm. And, you know, and so a weakness and ugly part of my life, I think, is the fact that I I struggle sometimes to finish things. Hmm. Um, But here's the beauty of that ugliness of not having known my dad. Um, I transitioned that into this just deep, strong and hard commitment to say, I'm I'm not going to give the same to my kids. And so in, in an, you know, era when a lot of people will abandon um, that commitment, I, I think it really became a, a huge advantage for me uh, because it was a line that I was never going to cross, regardless of any weakness that was inside of me. You know, so that's when I talk about the ugly advantage, that's really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those things that when you're in the middle of it, it seems like there is no light in that dark thing. Yes. Uh, but if you can get through it and if you can get to something else, man, you can actually at some point look back and say, man, there was a huge advantage to that horrible, awful thing that I went through. Mm -hmm. So was there a point where you made this mindset shift, kind of reframed it? Was Was there a certain point in your life where you're like, I need to see this differently? Or how did you kind of work through that? Yeah, you know, there's definitely shifts where I, I started to recognize, but I, I think because of how I grew up, I, I don't think I really had an option to begin with. You know, I talk, talk about in the book, I talk about this thing called the if when paradigm mm-hmm. that people that say I will be happy if or I will be successful when people that use that kind of vocabulary will never get happy. They will never get successful. 
you have to be able to say, I'm happy regardless, or I'm successful now because. And so I always, I, I never had that if, when as part of my being, because I would have had to say it all the time, right. you know, because I started, you know, at the bottom rung. So, you know, when I, you know, years and years later, when I got this amazing opportunity to do a TED Talk, mm -hmm. and I'm standing in the green room in the back, you know, there's 3,000 people out in this beautiful opera house waiting to hear from me, and I'm talking to all these speakers, and they're, you know, um, Yale and Harvard grads, they're, um, they're PhDs, they're New York Times bestselling authors. I didn't sit back there and go, man if only this, or, you know, I'll be a good TED speaker when, I mean, that never crossed my mind. You know, the whole time I'm thinking, I have a story to tell. I have something that people want to and need to hear. So, so there's been shifts throughout my life, Yes. but, but I started with a really strong foundation that was birthed out of weakness, you know, something that a lot of people would say was weak. But I would say really, if you talked about shifts, Matt, the mm -hmm. biggest shift for me was when I had my first kid. I mean, mm. that was really the tectonic shift for me. Mm. That little baby pops out and it changes <laughs> everything, doesn't it? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm I, I'm always amazed that you know I've got you, you know I've got three children and when each of them popped out, it's this almost like defining moment where you at least I let, kind of laid out my heart to my child, even though they had obviously no clue what I was talking about uh, <laughs> at the time of course but yeah. it's, it's you kind of lay out the legacy you want to leave and how you want to help them I, I, I think it's yeah really interesting to go through yeah it's I mean to me it's one of the the most poignant you know uh, moments for me in my life and uh, you know it doesn't have to be a kid yes. but that's what it was for me that's wild so you know you've got a tremendous drive um, and work ethic. And, you know, even though I know you, you, like you said, you struggle when sometimes things get difficult, you might have the tendency to move yeah. on to something else. W where ultimately does that drive come from? Like what, what's motivating you to get up every day and do what you do? Yeah. You know, it's funny because uh, a lot of people who would have known me in high school or growing up, even my best friend, I, I think he would recognize there was a shift. Um, that I didn't necessarily have that same drive and motivation. Mm. Um, but I think, I, I think it really started when I went to college and I went to college, uh, to be a youth pastor and I, uh, graduated and I became a pastor, a youth pastor at this church. Mm -hmm. And one of my objectives there was to, you know, make a difference to do something good and to really speak into the lives of these young people. And so one of the ways that I had experienced it growing up in high school and I wanted to share with them was by going on trips to, to do good. So we went on trips and we, I took high schoolers on trips and we would distribute food and build orphanages and um, teach school and do all sorts of things. Yes. And really to show, show people um, you may feel like you don't have a great, but let's see the other side of that coin and kind of change change your perspective. So I think I really think that was really the the moment where I saw a deeper meaning and a deeper purpose. And and once I experienced that, all of a sudden it was as if I had this furnace that had been living inside me but I had never put fuel into it. And all of a sudden I put fuel into it and I remember thinking, "Who, there is nothing that's going to stop me." You know, I, I'm going to do some amazing things and this fire is going to burn. I'm going to keep feeding it. Um, so that probably was the moment where that fire started to build. That's pretty wild because when you hear about, you know, just what you said, like you being able to reach those children, like you, you had this recognition of a gift that you had to be able to yeah. reach differently than other individuals. Yeah. And, and then the, the fire was lit, right? And you just yeah. started pouring gasoline. Um, I've got a, uh, I heard this, uh, it was one, one of my pastors actually, he talked once, um, he was saying when you have a fire, right? Or, you know, maybe yeah. your, your child is on fire for something or, yeah. or, you know, whatever your company is like just on fire and you either bring gasoline or you bring water. Huh, yeah. <laughs> and, and I always love that because it, there's those moments where when somebody's just 
cranking. It's like, oh my gosh, this is this discovery moment. Mm. Us as leaders and just, you know, parents or whatever situation, friend, are we, are we bringing gasoline or are we bringing water? Man, that's so true. Yeah. So, and I, I love, I love how you framed it there around leadership too, because I, I know I've had leaders who, who brought both, you know, different ones. Mm-hmm. Some brought water, some brought fuel. That's, that's really interesting. How, you know, I, I love sitting with you because well, for a number of different reasons, but, you know, we, we get to talk leadership and, and culture and, you know, helping people connect with their, you know, ultimate gifts. Yeah. Doing what you do now, what is your ultimate down deep driver? Like what's, what's your why? Yeah, I think my why, you know, and I've, I think it changes a little and we recognize new things as we get older. And, but at the end of the day, the word that I keep going back to is influence. Um, you know, I feel like I've been given a gift, a gifting to be able to communicate ideas in a very energetic and passionate way, mm-hmm. in a way that kind of speaks to people beyond the intellect. Um and to me, that is the essence of uh, influence. You know, it's the ability to connect with someone, not just on the intellectual level, but at a deep emotional level, to drive them to be different tomorrow than they were today. Um, so that's really my driver. And that's why, you know, going back to the TED experience, mm-hmm. standing on that stage, I was, di- I was completely different than most people on that stage. There was a lot of people that had you know, done dissertations and had data that just was all over the place. And I'm telling stories about uh, just having to start shaving my ears. You know, I'm, (laughs) I'm, I'm the person that is connecting at a different level. And I'm okay with that. That's who I am. That's my story. But to me, that's how you build influence when you connect, not just on an intellectual level, but on a deeper, meaningful level. That's wild. And so I, I'll have to hear that story sometime. Um, it be historical. I'll put a, I'll actually uh, get a link to the Ted talk from you and make sure I put that awesome. in the show notes as well. Thanks, man. Um, Cause I think that's, I mean, you do, you do have a very special gift for that. And what's unique about, I think you as well is like your willingness to share that story and the confidence yeah. in sharing it. Um, so two kind of questions on that. Um, one is, you know, I say all the time that, you know, people have a story and they need to share it. Yeah. Um, do you believe the same? And, and what would you kind of tell people who are on the kind of the edge of saying, like, listen, I, should I tell it? Should I not? What would you say to those people? Yeah, I everyone has a story. No question. And what I would say is there are so many people who take their story to the grave because they spend their life trying to look pretty. And they spend their life trying to mimic someone else, you know, someone else that's a been successful or someone else that looks good or they like the sound of. Mm -hmm. Uh, And in doing so, they are robbing the world of their story. You know, there's a great Les Brown quote. He said, the richest place on the planet is the grave. And the reason it's so rich is because it's full of songs that were never sung, books that were never written, inventions that were never made. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the big reasons that people don't share their story is because they're trying to be something they're not. And that Matt just goes right back to the heart of this ugly advantage book. This is why I want to get this out there because I want people not just to get comfortable with the ugly side of themselves. I want them to know that that's where their story lives. Their story lives there. It's not in me trying to sound like Gary Vaynerchuk or Tony Robbins. Yes. You know, that's not where my story lives. My story lives in the ugliness that is Peter. And I, I when I get the, the minute I got OK with that, to me, that's when I started telling the best stories. And that's when I really started making the biggest influence. Gosh, isn't that isn't that so true that people relate to the ugly? That, that's what they yeah. most relate to because even, you know, sometimes you look at the Gary V's and the, that of the world and it's almost like I can't, yeah. I can't understand them. Right. And yeah. I don't, I don't know. I don't yeah. understand their world, but when you get with somebody and they're, I, I, this is not discounting them at all. I, I think they're fabulous at yeah. what they do. Um, but it's like when they tell the stories, when anybody tells that story of like, listen, well, let me tell you about the adversity I went through. Let me tell you about this, how yeah. I was angry or pissed off or how I really screwed this up. Yeah. Right. That's, 
that's fun to hear because yeah. then you sit back and you're like, oh, my gosh, you are just like me. Right? I'm screwing up stuff left and right. I mean, I, most of our conversations yeah. are about how we screw up things. Um, yeah, that's right. And, and, and to your point, that's relatable. And now you know somebody's on the path with you or has walked the path. And like, you know, whether it's an inspirational, like I pulled through it and you can do it too, or whatever the message is, yeah. uh, the best yeah. stories come from the ugly. The best stories. Absolutely. Down. They do. No question. It's, uh, I mean, I don't know, like the, the ones, Matt, that come to my head, you know, it's, it's Rick and Dick Hoyt. If you've never seen that, go to YouTube and Google it and watch it. Okay. It's amazing. You know, it's, um, and I can't remember how he says his, his name of Vichuliak or something along those lines. You know, the guy, he has, uh, no arms and legs and his story is breathtaking and moving. Mm. I mean, there's so many of these amazing stories that they, they seem ugly. There's a new one, this gal, she was, uh. She was an ultra marathoner in uh, Australia. She got caught in a, a brush fire and was burnt badly all over her body. And her story is now going all over uh, LinkedIn and Facebook. And it is so powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I just love to see people have the ability to embrace something that that seems ugly, mm -hmm. but it can actually free them to live their story. So it's, you know, I, I encourage people to go around and find those stories that resonate with you and watch what those people are doing. A lot of times what they're doing is being really raw and authentic. Mm. And I think that's such a key part of like the authenticity and, you know, on social media, we see a lot of, you know, when you're scrolling through Facebook or uh, you know, in any of them, Instagram, whatever, it's like all yeah. of a sudden you're judging yourself like, wow, my life is terrible. <laughs> like, I do nothing. I don't travel. I don't. Uh, <laughs> any... So, so you, <laughs> you start feeling bad about yourself because we try to put on this facade yeah. instead of like, you know, going to the point of like, well, you know, that was a great trip. Yeah. But there's a lot of other, th a lot of stuff and it doesn't have to be necessarily bad, but there's the daily struggles that we all go through. We try to paint this picture. Yeah. And you know, Matt, I had, there's a great story I got to share real quick. So one of the things I had to do when I was, you know, prepping to be a, a pastor is I had to sit in some marriage counseling. And I remember sitting with this senior pastor in marriage counseling and this, I was at this point 20, probably 23. And I'm sitting with this couple that's married and they're in their mid twenties. And we're with this pastor who I think was in his mid fifties at the time. And this couple was a disaster. I mean, it was like I'm sitting there going, "Oh yeah, this this ain't gonna last." <laughs> and the 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 senior pastor he looked at them and he said, "I got to tell you guys, you should be really excited about where you are." And the look on their face probably matched the look on my face because I was like, <laughs> "What is, is he talking about?" And the, he was a he was a mountain climber, so he had spent a lot of his time climbing mountains in the Cascades, Mount Rainier. Mm -hmm. Mount Adams, all those. And he said, the thing I love, he said, the summit is only the summit because I started in the valley. He said, if I lived my entire life at the summit, it would mean nothing to me. Mm. He said, you guys, yeah, you're in a valley. Yeah, that sucks. He said, but if we can get you through this, you guys are going to experience a summit that is going to be amazing. So mm. what the problem in social media is, is what we see are the summits. Yes, uh, but we don't see all the valleys, and the problem is we then try to replicate uh, a summit lifestyle, where it's like, how do I live where I'm always here? Man, if you did that, the summit would no longer mean anything. Yes. So, uh, you know, I really I, I like to get people to understand this idea and this notion that, that valleys are okay. Mm. Well, and I and I think from those valleys, I mean, that's where you learn. That's where you you have to look in the mirror. That's where you have to make that assessment of like, am I going to do something with this or not? And how can this make me better? Yep. Can I take advantage of this ugly moment? Yes. Like uh, Matt, I mean, one of my favorite stories of yours is when you talk about not making the team at Creighton, yeah, you man. know, that could, that's a Valley, but man, amazing to me, the story that birthed out of that moment. No, it, it's so true. Cause I mean, as you're talking, I'm, I'm actually going through, all the ugly times in my life that have led me to this point. Um, and I know yeah. they will continue. And, and we were even talking before and, and I'm just like that baseball story. I was so, I'm so thankful looking back that I was cut my freshman year. Right. Cause it, it just positioned yeah. me even to start this business and, and doing what I yeah. do today. And I was even thinking, cause uh, in, you know, you're, 
you're almost done here with the, the ugly advantage and that'll be coming out soon. And, and I'm writing my new book now. And, and, you know, we just had this discussion yeah. of, you know, this one chapter that I was hesitating putting in the book and it was out <laughs> yeah. and then it was in, and then it was back out and then it was back <laughs> in again and then it was out. And then I pinged you and said, what do you think? You're like, I think that's interesting. So I put it back in and <laughs> it was an ugly yeah. moment for me because in this chapter and you know, it's all on finances, right. And your relationship with money. Yeah. And again, out yeah. of, you know, the, the way I grew up, the way I was raised, money was always tight. So I, I, I didn't growing up have this abundance mindset. And I even thought yeah. of like, do I put this in the book? Cause it's exposing something about me <laughs> that it's just, it's a weakness. It's something I'm working on. It's, yeah. And it's something yeah. that's not pretty. Like, <laughs> And it's not bad. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, it's in a good spot, but, um, from like yeah. a tracking perspective, it's it's ugly, right? And and I work yeah. on it, and that's exactly why um, I put it back in because this ugly is is, is now become an advantage of mine, um, and it's something absolutely. that you know out of you know a valley is coming something just absolutely phenomenal. Um, so the the whole yep. ugly advantage concept just it resonates with me, and I think the biggest pieces of of, of it though is that I recognize those ugly moments. And, yeah. but it's going a step further of like, how do I tell that story? How do I surround yeah. myself yeah. with others that I can share that with of something that I've gone through in my past or I'm, incur- I'm currently going through to share it? Yeah. Um, because people are out there who want to help, right? I don't want to surround myself with the people who are going to judge. Um, yeah. That doesn't help anybody. Um, but that, yeah. the, the ugly advantage, I think, resonates with me quite a bit. That's what? great. Yeah. And I would, I would say too, Matt, you know, that it's not just that there's people out there that can help. There's people out there that need to hear your story right where it is today. That is so true. That is so true. Yeah. We, we think we're alone a lot in our journey and we are absolutely yeah. not. Um, <laughs> so who has been like one of the most influential people in your life and why were they so important? Um, you know, I have several, you know, obviously my mom, just because she really taught me about strength and resilience, uh, amid daunting odds. Um, so she, she's probably at top of the list. You know, my best friend, Chad has been just a shining example of how far somebody can go when they commit and work as something. Uh, Mark Sanborn has been an amazing mentor to me around, you know, telling my story um, and and getting that out there. You know, I'm surrounded by amazing people like you and um, Ken and Chris and Steve. And I mean, there's so many people around me that are amazing. And then lastly, and certainly not least important, my family. Yes. Um, you know, they they are probably the, the center of uh, what makes me me right now. Mm. And what people don't realize is that you were in corporate America for a long time uh, yep. and you worked in various, you know, leadership and development, HR roles at, at a bunch of very big companies, well-known companies, and you thrived in that environment and you uh, decided to break off and start <laughs> his studio and start your own business. And um, yeah. so there's a couple of things I want to, want to ask around that. But first, you know, talking about your family and like the small things count, you know, when you made that transition, how did you kind of address the the family side of things to make sure that those little things yeah. didn't drop? What are some strategies? Because I think that, that holds a lot of people back from, you know, that they're going to upset the apple cart. And, and we'll talk a little bit about the stress that yeah. comes with owning your own business and that. But um, how, how from just yeah. a family perspective, I think that's so key. How did you deal with it? How do you currently yeah. deal with it? Well, well, it's interesting. This was this was this uh, instance was very unique compared to any others. You know, I've done this in the past where I've been in between jobs and I've done startups or I've done it while I've had jobs and you know, there's always been some fear and trepidation. This really was the first time ever where I I actually remember us sitting down at the dinner table and telling the uh, the whole family, "Hey, I'm going to put in my notice." Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I remember one of my kids said, well, how long are you going to stay? And I told them, well, you know, they're probably going to want me to stay a little longer. And they were like, no, you need to get out now and start. And my wife, she's like, why aren't you going to start sooner? I mean, this was it was an, a tectonic shift in their response. And I think it had little to do with them. I think it was all about me because this is the first time ever 
that I think I showed up with 100%, not just intention, but also the commitment behind it to actually put in the work to move towards it. So they saw something in me that was completely different than every other time before. So there was complete alignment. So my strategy, if people say, well, what's a strategy to get your family aligned? Is to get your butt in gear and do stuff, to show them that this isn't just a hope or a dream or an idea, but this is something that you are bound and determined to make happen. I absolutely love that because it's showing up with a confidence to your family yeah. because you know, I, I interviewed um, a relationship expert, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago and we talked a lot about, you know, male versus female needs and, and female needs, yeah. uh, you know, well, male, like we feel like we have to be in control. So, um, I think if, yeah. you're, if you're married, your wife typically knows how to make you think you're in control, even though, you know, she is, at least that's the way it is for my wife and my relationship, but <laughs> I, I've come yeah. to terms with that. Yeah. Um, but you know, <laughs> women ultimately need to feel that they're taken care of. Right, that that yeah. things there's that stability there, and I think you showing up with that confidence was huge because you you had this action plan and you were executing and and it's, yeah. it's like you had wins before you even pulled the trigger on yeah on yeah. that happening. Then it was this natural transition out. Um, what yep. what was the scariest thing for you making like making that decision and saying like it's it's done? Well, for sure, the scariest thing. You know, I had a great job. Yeah. I loved my team. I loved who I worked with. I was enjoying the work I was doing. I mean, there was no logical reason <laughs> to leave. <laughs> so that, that without question was the hardest. It's like, I, you know, at one point I'm asking myself, I'm like, why am I doing this? Yep. So that was, uh, that was definitely the hardest uh, thing when I to, to leave was because I was in a great situation. Yeah. So cash flow in theory goes away. Um, that kind of fear of the unknown yep. a little bit. What what was the tipping point this time? What was different? So the tipping point was uh, I had a personal coach, and he really challenged me unlike I'd ever been challenged. So he had uh, told me that he wanted to work with me at a deeper and a stronger level. And he came back to me, and he gave me this offer, and it was expensive. It was a lot of money. And I told him, I said, let me get back to you in a couple days. Well, a couple of days came and went and I did what I typically do, which is when things scare me as I run away from them or I ignore them. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't get back to him. Well, the minute the time timeline came and went, he sent me a message and he said, Peter, he said, I just want you to know that what you just did is why you won't succeed. The deal is off the table. Now, he was asking for me to pay him a lot of money and he pulled this deal out from under me because I showed up in a way that he knew was why I was failing. Mm -hmm. And that moment was really a trigger for me to say, you know, I, I have done the easy thing when I get afraid. So when I have fear, I will step back or I'll ignore it. And I've done the easy thing. And I said, for the, this is the first time ever that somebody has really called me out on that. And so it challenged me. And I spent the next month saying, I'm going to change my perception. I'm going to stop running from fear. And I'm actually going to run towards fear. So what's the most fearful thing for me right now? Well, it's quitting a great job that pays me very well and running towards this thing that I believe is what I should be doing right now. Mm -hmm. And I spent a month doing that and I saw progress. And that was the first time ever that I had really run towards fear. And so that was my tipping point. And that's when I knew, okay, I think it's time for me to make this decision moving towards that thing that's really scary. Did you, so you ended up working with him or no? Well, him and I were very connected, very close. He said, he keeps telling me that we will work together uh, in the future for sure. So um, we're, we're, we're very connected. We talk a lot. That's fascinating how it, it, it's, it's counterintuitive what he did, right? Absolutely. Instead of him him, uh, you pulling the deal and saying, Hey, I'm, I'm taking it off the table. Dang it. Your coach <laughs> yeah. who wants yeah. a lot of money says, no, no, money. no I'm done. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I'm yeah. done. You're out. What a, yeah. that's a huge it was a, defining it was, moment. <laughs> yeah. Huge defining gutsy, gutsy move on his part. I mean, he's one of the, you know, most authentic and real people I know. 
That is fabulous. Um, gosh, man, I'm going to have to meet this guy and shake his hand because um, he is yeah, right. <laughs> unleashed an absolute uh, stud uh, in the market who gets to do oh, his, it full yeah. time now. So. It, <laughs> yes, and, and his, his name is Dominic Cortuccio, just an amazing guy. That's awesome. So you, what was one way like you ran towards that, that fear? Like as you're, as you're looking at that month, right? Working on this and making yeah. that final decision. Can you share with, with the listeners, like what was maybe even one thing you worked on to help kind of shift that mindset to like, I'm going to run towards the fear, towards the fear, towards, like what was it? Yeah. Well, I knew that I knew that I had to be able to tell a story that resonated with people. Mm -hmm. So what I started to do is I started to share that story more and more with people in my circle and beyond mm -hmm. to see if it resonated. Because I knew, you know, if I can tell the story and it resonates, then I know, yeah, I'm moving in the right direction. I should keep going. And so that's what I did. I spent the month building content, sharing my story, doing things on social media. And what I found is that this message was resonating with people. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, to me, that's what it was all about. It was, uh, it wasn't, Am I going to be able to generate the money? It wasn't all of these things because to me it was, do, are people going to find value in it? Because if people find value in it, then I can sell it. I can make money on it eventually. Um, I can get there. So that was my process. I love it too because it's it's doing enough digging, right, where to ensure, yeah. almost test it, right? You're, you've kind of piloted it yep. in a way, if you will, and saying, hey, listen, the concept's there. It's resonating. I've got enough data yep. now to make an informed decision and not just – yeah, when you have a good job, just being like willy nilly, hey, I'm out of here, and I'll figure it out when I'm <laughs> that's when right. I quit. It was preparing for that moment. That's, that's right. That's fascinating. So, can you provide everyone kind of a an overview of what like Hitch Studio is? Because you, you've got this, yeah, yeah, you know, the ugly advantage coming out, and I know you've got a lot of broader yeah. stuff within Hitch Studio, including Meeting Spark, which we've partnered on a little bit. But can you give just a quick overview yeah. of like how how do you describe it? I mean, to me, I describe it as we we want to be the leader in um, this understanding the future of talent. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to me, talent is the next killer app within companies. Um, if you can find and hire and keep the best people, you will win in the marketplace. And, you know, I have this quote um, that I've been leveraging as of late. And I said, you know, a lot of these companies want to win in the marketplace, but I'm telling you, you cannot win in the marketplace if you are losing in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the general high level focus of Hitch is helping companies win in the marketplace through the workplace. So it's helping them create real culture. It's helping them create real leaders, helping them create real community and connection. And if they do that, they win in the marketplace. And the book is the genesis of this idea, because in the book, I talk about the four ugly ingredients. But I say, if you live these ingredients, what you create is ugly connection, uh, ugly co coaching, which is the leadership, ugly community and ugly culture. And so really Hitch Studios, that's what we want to do. We want to transform companies by bringing a completely different view. And Meeting Spark is one of the products by which we want to do that because we want to take these ugly old meetings and ugly not in a good way. And right. we want to transform them. <laughs> and we want to transform them into a completely different thing. I think it's I mean it's it's phenomenal because I think a lot of companies out there have this, you know, sales pitch that, you know, we've got this great culture and you know, yeah, we, we treat our people well. And then a lot of times I hear that people get in these companies and it's like, whoa, what was sold is not yeah. what's really happening here. Um, yep. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that we're trying to be something we're not. Um, yeah. Instead yep. of embracing the ugly, whatever that is right now, of course, a bunch of areas you can improve. Um, like, yeah. Don't get me wrong, which I know you're, you're, able to come in and help companies identify like, what do you want this to really look like? Um, yeah. And, and how do we help you take steps to get there? Let's talk about like the four ugly ingredients. Do you mind kind of giving an overview of kind of what those are for the listeners? Yeah. So uh, ugly is an acronym I use. And so the four ingredients are unique, which is where you find your voice. Uh, and then gutsy, which is where you start to build your belief. 
and then likable, which is where you live your humility, and then yourself, which is releasing your impact and being who you were designed to be. You think like companies you've worked with and stuff, is there one in particular that sticks out or is it kind of a company by company basis, person by person basis? Yeah, it really is a company by company. You know, the one that, and it's funny because you and I actually talked about this, Matt, and I did not want to write this chapter. I was trying to find anything else other than likable for L. I, I didn't want to write this chapter, but after I kept trying to write other chapters, I kept coming back to, I have to, I have to write this. I don't want to, but I have to, because this is one of the biggest missing ingredients that I see across the board. You know, that as people build their impact and influence, a lot of times what they lose is a likability factor and they become jerks. And when they start to do that, they really start to lose their impact and they start to damage their community and connections and everything else. So it's the chapter I'd never wanted to write because it's oatmeal. You know, it's right. bland. It's It has no flavor to it. But, you know, oatmeal is one of those things that almost, you know, anyone who's putting you on a nutrition plan will say oatmeal is probably some of the best protein you can get. Right. Um, but it's bland. And so that's the one that a lot of people don't talk about. I didn't even want to talk about necessarily, but I think it's so important. Um, that's why I put it back into the book. Um, and I see that a lot in organizations. You know, um, a lot of times I always say organizations don't really know who their competitor is. Um, they spend the entire day and week and month competing against people within the walls of their company. Uh, and when they do that, you will never be a true competitor, a real competitor, if you're competing with inside the walls of your team. You know, we know this from how teams work. And so that's one of the big things I say is going in and saying, boy, you have a lot of people who are not living this uh, ugly leadership in a way that uh, is focused on the right thing. They're competing with the person sitting next to them that should be their teammate. So that's a big one that I see. And that's really interesting, right? It's that, yeah, because I, I, I'm now thinking back to you know, times I've been in corporate America and there is that just underlying competitive nature and it can get absolutely out of control if you're not careful. Like people vying for the promotions or yes. to do better work or have you know yeah. better project deadlines and, and meet and exceed and all that yeah. stuff. And instead of focusing on what is the bigger picture, what are we, like, what are we actually driving towards here? Because... If we want promotions, if we want great projects, yes. if we want all this stuff, it's about the bigger thing first. Um, hey, let's figure out how to work yep. together and make it happen. Yeah. Do you believe, because I was having this conversation with somebody just two days ago, actually, um, because I think, you know, as human beings, we're, we're built to be social beings, right? We're, we're built to fit yeah. in with groups. And yep. I think there's this common... You know, one client I was working with, she she's like, "Why well, I, I don't think some of the people like me. And yeah. I said, well, do you have their respect? Yeah. And it was that whole kind of changing it, saying kind of the respect piece. Once they yeah. respect you, the likability comes. It's not liking and yep. then ultimately going to respecting because you can lose respect pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's uh, I definitely think the the heartbeat of likability is respect, mm -hmm. um, because there are moments that as a leader where I was not the nicest person, you know, I uh, I reacted or I made people feel a certain way. Yes. Um, but one thing that I guarantee as a leader that I always did is if I found out about this or I, I reached out and somebody told me is I tried to rectify it. So. You know, I can think of a, a great example at um, um, at my last company. There was someone on the phone and they were it felt like they were dragging their feet and I was frustrated. And I said, I am not the kind of person that will drag my feet. If you don't want to be part of this, you don't have to. I'm going to move forward. You know, that is not very likable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not. And I, you know, I got a, I jumped off the conference call yep. and I didn't know this person that well either. You know, I didn't know their motivation. I didn't give a chance. To, I didn't seek to understand. You know, I was that was a bad moment for me. Uh, but where I think I switched the flip and I got back to likable is I reached out to them and I said, hey, is it OK if I come over and we talk? And they said, yes. 
and I went over and I apologized and I said, you know, I didn't give you a chance. Share with me what you're thinking. Man, at the end of the day, we became like the best co-workers and peers. I mean, we we worked together so well and respect was built. And I actually think a lot of the respect was built because of how ugly the first situation was, but that we recovered from it. Mm-hmm. So likable is not this soft, you know, it's not this soft thing where you're just, you know, uh, accommodating to everyone. No, you still have fire in your belly. You still want to win. You're still doing the hard things, but you have the humility. And that's why my subtext there is living your humility. Yes. You have the humility to go back and fix the, the things that need to be fixed. I love that. I love that. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, you described it really well. Um, I absolutely love that. I'm a big uh, humility guy as well. So that that chapter yeah. resonates with with me quite well. And um, I think you've taken it from bland to something that we can actually implement <laughs> and that can uh, influence in a positive way our colleagues and, and even use that same thing from a family perspective. I think that's enormous. Yes. Um, yes. What, you know, one thing that... Uh, in, I'll, I'll be respectful of your time. And, and, uh, so just a couple more questions, if, if that's all right with you. Um, yeah. you know, meeting spark, I think is, is fascinating. And again, I've been very fortunate to, to be a little involved in it and, and provide some content. Yeah. Um, and it's such a unique idea that I wanted to, to have you talk about it a little <laughs> bit, because I know you are out to be like the king of micro content, right? Um, but focused yes. on like how do we maximize value within organizations? And one of the big ways is through, like you, like you mentioned earlier, how do we revamp the way we meet, the way we interact, yeah. um, to, just to, again, squeeze that value out of it. So um, give a little yeah. overview of like meeting Spark and its purpose and, and uh, you give people some insight into that. Yeah, so I, it's one of the things I hated more than anything else in corporate America were meetings. There were too many. They were boring. They were long. I was in the wrong ones. I mean, there was just a million things wrong with meetings. You know, there's 25 million meetings every day in the U.S. Um, 65% of executives believe they're a failure. 48% of managers believe they're a failure. 72% of people bring other work to meetings. I mean, meetings are the most broken thing, I think, in corporate America, and they cost companies billions of dollars. Yep. You know, I think Forbes estimated it to be a $62 billion a year problem. I actually think it's higher. Um, and so, I mean, I think it's a combination of multiple things. And I've seen a lot of companies start to do some things that are helping. Like one of the things I did every time I would go to a company is first thing I would do is I would send out a meeting to my whole team for half the day on Friday. Um, and it was called no meeting Friday. Mm. And I blocked their calendar to protect their time. I just heard another um, CEO. I think he's the CEO of Asana. Mm. He said they have no meeting Wednesdays. Um, and there's there's just too many meetings. They fill up – like if if you look at the typical executive's day, I mean they could be in 10 or 12 meetings a day. I mean they have no time to do anything else. And meetings tend to be an hour long. Yes. Or 30 minutes because ju- not for the reason that that's how long they should take, but because it fits in the Outlook template. Yes. So we, I just think we, if for too long we haven't thought about meetings. So what I think we have to do is I think we have to elevate the meetings that matter through some the science of what makes meetings work. Things like the right people, agendas, and action items. Um, and then the meetings that are horrible, get rid of them. And then get uh, – Remove people from the meetings they don't need to be in. If you do those three things, um, I think an organization is going to find this immense well of time. I mean, there prob- there's some companies that could recreate hundreds of FTEs or full-time employees yes. simply by doing this with meetings. Yeah, it's – I mean, anyone who's listening who has been with any company – for any period of time has experienced the pain of, of meeting with people and walking out saying, wow, that was a gargantuan waste of time. And the way you know it, at least the way I knew it, was that I walked away like exhausted yeah. um, because it sucks yes. the absolute life out of me. And I'm like, what are we doing here? And then my sarcasm would kick in and then I'm probably going back to your likability <laughs> chapter again and going back saying yes, I shouldn't have been sarcastic there. Um, and 
that that's what I love about the the focus. And I just love about you. You think outside the box, right? And it's it's how do we yeah. look at things differently? Attack the old problems, and but do it in a realistic way. Um, look at how yeah. you set it up. It's a process. It's a system. And if we're consistent yep. with it, um, and we we are yep. disciplined with it, then that's yep. where absolute magic happens. Um, and the, yeah, the for probably, sure. I think the cool, one of the coolest parts of, of meeting Spark, aside from like, you know, the consulting side and, and all the great work that you can do within companies to help them really realign it is the, the micro content, right. And, and going in and yeah. starting meetings off differently and than they ever have yep. before in these kind of, you know, one to two minute snippets, um, to get people focused yep. on like, what is the purpose? What are we here to do? We've incorporated like mental toughness stuff in it, which I think is, it's yes. way outside the box thinking, but it's like priming them to have effective meetings. Well, Matt, think about like one of the topics that you recorded for us is on breathing and the power of breathing. Mm -hmm. Now, imagine going into a meeting. You're at work and the first two minutes of your meeting is a world class expert walking you through the benefits of breathing and putting you through an exercise to learn how to breathe. Now, that takes total three minutes, roughly. Right. At the end of that three minutes, you are now in a state of mind where you can attack the problem that you have to solve in that meeting. You're no longer the person who's doing other work, who's disengaged, who doesn't want to be there. Now you are focused. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I think it's, it's amazing and it's outside the box thinking. But to your point, if we're to, in the future of talent, right, to find, hire, keep the yep. talent, create this amazing culture that's different from everyone else where people want to work. You've got to start doing yeah. things differently. And I think meeting sparks one of the like perfect ways to do that. It's just, it's so unique. I, yeah. I, I have no idea how you even came up with it to this day. I don't even, I don't even know if we <laughs> talked about it other than like the pain, yeah. the pain that you went through. It was, yeah, it was based <laughs> on the sheer pain. It's like no more, no more. Yeah. Um, I absolutely love that. So, um, you know, before we we kind of wrap up and stuff, uh, you know, how can how can be people best find you and learn about Peter Lynch and Hitch Studio? Yeah, yeah. So a um, couple ways you can go to the website. It's Hitch Studio. Um, that's one way. I also um, am on social media, and typically, so Instagram and uh, Twitter, it's at Real Peter Lynch. And then um, on Facebook, you can find me, Peter Lynch Speaking. Um, and then on LinkedIn, it's Peter Lynch. Um, um, and you could just search Great West or Western Union, mm. and you'll find me on there. Okay. Um, but if you go to hitch.studio uh, or peteralynch.com, um, you'll be able to link to almost all of those. And then also, obviously, I got the, the new book coming out, The Ugly Advantage. Um, so be looking for that. Uh, Amazon and different places to buy. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll make sure that obviously in the show notes, all links to all this stuff and, and the ugly advantage of, as well. Um, so that people can keep up to date on, on, uh, you know, when it, it's going to be published and, and the pre-order list and all that stuff as well, which will be awesome. Um, let me, I, I was going to ask you my last question, like tell me a joke because you put in your bio, like his greatest skill <laughs> is an epic joke a dad joke telling ability that makes his eyes roll, make his, makes his kids eyes roll with 99% uh, predictability. But I won't ask you that. Um, what's, <laughs> what's, uh, well, maybe I should, but no, what's one kind of final no. <laughs> uh, piece of advice that, that you would uh, leave with our listeners to just get them fired up, excited about, uh, about life? Well, I tell them you, we, what we talked about earlier is you have a story. Not, not only do you have a story, but you have a story that it has value. Um, it has monetary value and it has value in changing people's lives. Um, to me, there is there is no greater purpose than impacting people and providing uh, a success for the, your loved ones. And I, what I would tell everyone is they have something inside of them. Now, it might not be a story that they tell from a stage. It might be what they write. It might be what they draw. It might be what they sing. It might be how they comfort. It might be, you know, it's, it's all over the place. It can be a million different things, but they all have that story. 
And if they can just tap into that and get comfortable with the ugliness that comes along with that story, um, they can make a really, really powerful impact. And you are taking your story and making a huge impact, Peter. And I'm just so, so blessed to have you in my life. And, and, and thank you so much for taking your time on this podcast. I really can't thank you enough. Uh, thanks, Matt. Likewise, uh, I truly appreciate having a chance to hang out with you. Awesome. We will talk soon, my friend. Thanks again. Thanks. Thanks.